Okay. Uh, pleased to welcome Professor Wolfmissen from Lund University, our partner uh, university for double degree diploma in uh, gender studies, and uh, our partner university for exchange of uh, students. And some of uh, you or your colleagues had already a chance to uh, study a semester in Lund. Some of you will have this chance, uh, this chance, uh, and. Uh, uh, today we will have uh, a pleasure to have a class by Professor Nielsen uh, on uh, modernity and the first uh, modern man. <laughs> so, Vintry, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And hey, everybody, it's nice to be back again, I must say, because I have been visiting your university several times. I think this is my fifth time in Kiev. Both, so I'm starting to get quite familiar both with the city and also with the Tarasyshenko University. So it's very nice to meet you, students. And as uh, Svetlana said, that I have been very much involved in a double degree program uh, together with uh, Lund University and Tarasyshenko University. And we also have uh, some, uh, uh, not from the double degree, but at least students and PhD students who have been to Lund for half a year, one year, and so on. So if you want to ask more about the university, you have some very good knowledge here in the left corner. Uh, so, my presentation today has the title that the first modern man was a woman. And I will go, let's say, a huge trip before I explain why the first modern man was a woman. I think there need to be explained a lot of things and uh, why I'm saying this. Uh, and uh, so at the end of the lecture, if you're waiting for it, it will come. I will explain to you. But I think we need to do have some background knowledge. It's also background knowledge that the first modern man who was a woman was a Swedish woman. Uh, uh, not only because I come from Sweden, I will explain why. I will say that the first modern man was a woman, he was a Swede. So, to start this uh, presentation, I think we will start with the concept modernity. And as you are sociologists, you are very familiar with this concept, modernity. This is a, a concept that is going through the, the, the discussion about, uh, let's say, the society from the middle of the 19th century or something like that, or even earlier, perhaps the late 18th century, we have been talking about as a description of the society. It's a modern society, it's modernity, and so on. So uh, this is to start with this concept uh, before we end up with this modern woman. And the first question to put there is actually, Svetlana is not uh, allowed to answer this question because we have heard this once before, I think. And the first question is actually, what does the concept modernity mean, or where does it come from? And normally, nobody almost can answer that question when I put the question, so don't feel embarrassed that if you don't are talking about modernity, but you don't know where the word comes from. So is anyone who has a suggestion? Where does the word modernity come from? What does it actually mean? Have any one of you come across that? Any suggestions? Yes, there is a suggestion. Uh, modernity. Maybe it's to describe period between the second half of the 19th century to the uh, start of First World War, and it was invented in like. Yeah. The 21st century to describe uh, what mm -hmm. came before postmodern. Yeah, it could be an answer, but it's not an answer. Where does the word come from? From the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> you take it back. It's a period. And there's also discussion are we still in that period or is that first modern? I will come back to that. But the concept. That's the interesting because I think the key to understand modernity is actually the background of the concept itself. Now I will see if I can handle this one. Don't. What is the meaning of the word modern? I've already put that question. <laughs> actually, 
the word in itself is from the year of around 400 something and it comes from a Latin word mudo and mudo is a word that is explaining that something is present or very close in time and that's the key for understanding modernity to see the world there almost didn't use this word at all because it was not necessary for the culture to say what is right now what is the present to give a de definition of the present then we have to wait almost until the end of the 18th century before it becomes important for the culture and for the human being to say what is this right now because that also means they must have a definition what was before what is going on today it's a concept of time and it's a concept of how to relate towards time that also means that if you say there is something right now they also say there is something different before but they also say in this that the future will look different and uh, ah, I've got a big audience today. Yeah. It must be the title. So out. <laughs> when you talk about gender and women and men, perhaps. Yeah? I can wait for the second one. You find somewhere to see it or stand. You have to book a seat. <laughs> Since they're recording it, so. This means actually also from now on, end of the 18th century, the culture start to give names to historical periods. This is different from that one, and this is different from that one, and this is different from that one. So this is important to keep in mind that modernity's background is actually, there are other backgrounds, but let's say from a mental perspective, that you have a new relationship towards time and you are very interested in what's going on right now and you also start to write about how the future will be. This is the period when they start to write different kind of manifests about the future. This is important. And we can also say that they ask about my place in the society today, in this am I in time or do I represent something let's say historic traditions so the first one who actually used the word modernity was the French author philosopher Rousseau he was the first one who gave let's say, a name to the society right now and describe it. And from the word modernity, we also got the, the word modernism. And modernism is normally connected to aesthetical or cultural expression in a modern society. Arts, architecture, music, theater, which we call modernism. And then we have also the concept modern. And that's more general to say something is modern. It's a modern human being. That's a more, let's say, a general that you belong as a human, you belong to society today. You have to put a guard outside there, no? <laughs> Amazing. So, I give you a historical background. This is the, I think, the first description of being a modern human being. And this is actually from a, a novel by Rousseau called The New Louise. And this is the, 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 the uh, let's say, the head character has moved to Paris. So it's a big city that we focus on, not 
as peaked as today, because we are at the end of the 18th century. And he writes letters back to his girlfriend living on the countryside. So now we start to see, let's say, a kind of uh, to divide people into countryside people and city people. And the city represents the modernity, and the countryside represents the traditional, not modern society. You can follow this kind of discussion through almost the whole modernity, this kind of countryside city, countryside city. In films and theatre and a lot of things you can see that. There has been a lot of Swedish film about this team, that someone from the countryside come to the city, and even worse, someone from the city come to the countryside uh, and uh, take all the girls from the boy, countryside boys and so on and destroy the mentality in a way. So like this, for instance, uh, this uh, Sampreur is called, who is writing back and saying, here in the city, and now we should think this is from the end of the 18th century, he's writing this. That in the city, every, everyone is constantly placing himself in contradiction with himself. Everything is absurd, but nothing is shocking. Because everyone is accustomed to everything. This is a world which the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, truth, virtue have only a local and limited existence. Everything is changing. That's what it is. And you have to be changeable all the time. And this is actually what many people today feel when they move from the countryside to a bigger city. This is, you have to change, you have to absolutely be another person and be very flexible. And uh, he also writes that he's beginning to feel the drunkenness and so on, tumultuous life and so on. And of all these things strikes me, there's nothing that holds my heart. Yet, of all them together disturb my feelings. So, and here comes a very important uh, sentence. So I forget who I am and who I belong to. This is very interesting because this is actually to problematize identity. And this is identity towards the society. We can see this kind of discussion about identity before in Confucius and, uh, and in Augustinus and many other uh, 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 books, but then it's the identity towards God. Another problem is identity towards the society. And this is a part of the modernity, which is quite new. To put the question, who am I? And this question follows the modernity all the time. And I have put it many more times than my parents. And my kids have put it many more times than I, I suppose. And so, who am I? So, we have this about city and countryside all the time. And we also have that identity becomes a problem. A something you have to construct yourself. This is... I mean, slowly process. I mean, my parents were quite, not totally sure, but they were quite sure what they were going to be in the future. Or they could see some possibilities. But perhaps many today, depends on which class you come from, of course, where you come from, your parents' attitudes, but this kind of area for what will I be in the future become wider and wider. So, this about the countryside and, 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 and the city, about tradition and modernity, you can follow this discussion in all classical sociologists. That has been one of the main themes in sociology, actually, for the classical. You can also go back before sociology. I suggest you to understand modernity, you should read Faust, Goethe's Faust. Because that's a fantastic description. And one part of Faust is actually how he destroyed the countryside girl called Gretchen. And also how he created a new modern world in the third part of the Faust. It's a fantastic description about the modern society. <coughs> and Marx gets a lot of influences from Goethe, as well as many others. We have the Marx uh, Communist Manifest, which is a manifest, first of all, 
and then it's a really, let's say, analysis of modernity, what is modernity. But it also consists about countryside and city. I mean, Marx was actually the one who appreciates modernity more than anyone else. He was, this is a, 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 let's say, celebration to capitalism, the Communist Manifest. You should read it again and read it with new eyes and see it as a celebration of the, of the capitalism. Durkheim, you have, it's really quite familiar, you have the mechanical and organic solidarity, and you also have, he was very positive to modernity, but he was also afraid that human beings become much more dependent on their desire. I mean, the morality will, will fall. That's one of the Durkheim's actually, let's say, mission to the world, to create a new moral human, human being, because the capitalists destroy morality. And you become only dependent on your own desire. You want quick, I mean, satisfaction. You have in Libras the iron cage, which is a very critical discussion about modernity, that the rationality will absolutely destroy all of our feelings. We will become robots in the world. And so that is the civilization critical discourse by Weber. You, you're familiar with that. One of my favorites, actually, in, in this context is Simon, which took a lot of expression, uh, inspiration from Rousseau, actually. And his, uh, I don't know, are you reading his Metropolis, his very famous article about the city? You should, it's fantastic, as a classical text. There he actually discussed the human beings in a city and human beings in the, in the country, <coughs> and, and the conflict between this, and the changes between this, is it real? You also have the Turnis discussion about Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, which is also a classical text. In all this, you have this kind of discussion <coughs> about something belong to tradition, belong to the countryside, and you have a modern life. So, just to give some quotes very quickly from Marx, which is of course one of my favorite in, in the analysis of modernity. So that's that the bourgeoisie has uh, subjected the country to the rule <coughs> of the towns. And he's also talking about the population of the idiocy of the rural life and so on. So it's actually very critical against the countryside. You have to come up to a modern human being. Otherwise, we can't construct our dream of a socialist society. And this, that uh, also this, that the uh, bourgeoisie, uh, I mean, has created a massive and more colossal productive forces than have <coughs> all the preceding generations together. This kind of activity that's in the capitalism and in the modernity. And that also means if you're going to construct something, you have to destroy something. And that's actually really a signal for the capitalist uh, economy, is to destroy things, but also to create a lot of new things. So that's also a question that Faust got. Actually, he had to destroy something. There was an old couple living on a peninsula in an old house, but Faust wanted to be that quite new society. So we have to destroy the house of this old capital. And in that, then it's also when the devil, the fistulas, come into the Faust story with the help of the devil. So that shows this destroying of the time. And one of the most, mm -hmm. I shall not go too much into Marx, but one of the last sentences there that has also given name to a book by Marshall Berman, that all that solid melts into the air. That's Marx's description of modernity, but of, also, of course, of the capitalist society. That everything melts down. And that's the, that's, I mean, the, to destroy. And I will keep that what, when it comes back to this, the first modern man was a woman, is actually the, the necessity to destroy a lot of traditional values. And that's a part of it. So, so now we move to the next word from Moodoo, the modernist. 
So how can we see what kind of, let's say, reaction? If we have this background, it's about time, it's about changing all the time, it's about destroying, it's something that melts down all the time and so on. How should the art express this new society? And some of the group belonging to <coughs> the gender program will have an assignment a little bit connected to this, right? Mm -hmm. So, if everything is destroyed, if everything is changing, there is a speed in the society and so on, everything melts down, and we have some of the very early expression to see how modern art express this new society. And this is a very famous uh, piece of art from Picasso, and how to see how the bodies actually... I mean, this, this was a revolution in art. You didn't show a body like a body looked like. You, you have to try to show a body that was changing, was melting down. Uh, and actually connect it to the society today. And I think this is, for us, this is nothing new. I mean, we are, we are so familiar with it. But when it was presented for the first time, it was such a revolution. How could you actually paint like this? And the answer is, of course, yes, because of the society feeling of living in a new modern world is like this. Nothing is stable. And uh, some of the modern artists it, uh, went even further. They wanted to, how, how can we catch the speed in the society in a piece of art? And this is uh, uh, one of my favorites, Severini, Italian futurist. This is from 90, 1910 or 15 or something like that. Uh, he wanted, they loved the speed. They, love, they did a lot of arrangements about speed. I like airplanes and I like new technology. High speed, the better. The more speed, the better. And so As this kind of, uh, let's say, the new technology becomes some kind of symbol for the new society. Airplanes, trains, faster the better. So this is an uh, example of this. And I think it's important for sociologists, actually, that's one of our mission here today, that I think art is very important to understand the, the, what's going on in society. Art is, of, as a sociology, of course, art is uh, produced by the society we are living in, the structures of the society. But they also give an expression of, let's say, the heart of the society. And, secondly, they affect the society. So there's a dialectical relationship between art expression and society in general. Quite often we don't think so much about it, but, uh, uh, but when we look back on the revolution of the modernity, we should actually, we need to understand those kind of art expressions and so on, to fully understand the society. <coughs> Anyone who recognize this? Anyone who heard about him? No? So, that's my mission. You have to go back and look a little bit what happened in Ukraine during this period of the early modern art. You have quite a lot of very interesting uh, painters and so on in Ukraine. And they were very connected to the Russian futurists. So, uh, Malevich, you probably have heard. Yeah. Now, so the next step, art is of course, in a way, separating from, directly from society. I mean, compare with architecture, because architecture, you don't really only need to destroy something. You also have to build something that is going to stay in the society. And so the modernism in architecture is affected the, the, let's say the modern world more perhaps than art, but the connection between architecture and art was very, very common. There were groups together, and we come back to that. One early example of this is uh, Le Corbusier, the French architect. And if we look at this house, uh, what I was saying that, let's say, at the beginning of the modernism in architecture, that ornament was a crime. 
that was Alfred Laws in Indiana. So, so history is a crime. We should not look backwards. We should look at the society today and we should actually create architecture that is connected to the society. Because all architecture before Le, 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 Le Corbusier, perhaps not all architecture, there are uh, architecture that's not directly connected, but in general architecture used, let's say, symbols, forms and so on from the history from the Renaissance, from the ancient period, and all they have a lot of decoration, as the Jugend architecture, with a lot of flowers and grapes and everything in, in the architecture. Now they were saying uh, architecture should be clean from ornament, and it should have no historical connection, it should be connected to the society. So against tradition, and that's important to understand. Against tradition, what is going on right now? Let's make architecture connected to that. And uh, during this period, there was, now we're talking about the 1930s, which was actually almost end of the 1920s and 1930s, was actually when the modernist architecture started. In art, it was earlier. In literature, it was even earlier. So, with Baudelaire and Dimbo and uh, authors and so on. And many of those architectures, authors, painters and so on come together in groups. They wanted to actually change the society, not as individuals, but in groups come together as a more, let's say, revolutionary force in the society. So there was a lot of these <coughs> groups uh, in, in Europe by this time. One of the most famous is the Bauhaus. We also have in, in, in Russia, of course, the Russian Futurists, which connected uh, uh, literature and architecture and paintings and so on. We have in Holland, we have an Italy, Italian Futurists and so on. We have in France and so on. And as I come back later, we will also have that in Sweden. So this kind of group to change the society. And those group, well, not only wanted to change the society into modernity, it also bring in, let's say, a gender perspective in the discussion, which is important when I come back to this woman I will talk about later. So, we can see, modernity was the outcome of a serious major historical transformation. The, the four major social processes were the political. I will discuss the political. The political is, of course, you have political parties and so on, new political ideologies. And we can also see that the political discussion and debate was divided between, let's say, the pro-modernists, and that is the socialists and the liberalists, and the more conservative who actually talking about morality, about traditions, about values, about religions, and so on. So we have this split between, on the one hand, socialists and liberalists, and the conservatives. And we can see that through uh, the, 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 the modernity all the way. And actually we can see today that this split has become more obvious today again. Because the modernity always forced the society into this, to divide it like this. You can see it in Ukraine between the liberalists and I don't know so much about socialism, and I don't know so much about Ukraine politics, but in general in Europe, and you are affected and we are affected, that this kind of conservatism, the nationalism and so on, is growing as a protest against natural and modernity. We can see it all over uh, uh, Europe, and perhaps all over the world, to be honest. So we can see that through the modernity there has been this kind of discussion all the time. We had of course this discussion during the 1930s as well, and the reaction against the modernity. We can see that in the Nazi uh, period, for instance, the gluten border, back to our nationality, back to our background and so on, in Italy with Mussolini, and also in Russia.
Russia with Stalinists, who actually turned away from the modernity to more tradition, which affected, for instance, the art of the modernist art, like Picasso and the Russian Futurist world, were forbidden. Bauhaus in Germany was forbidden. We have, we have to actually focus on our own traditions, national values. And so on. The economic is actually what Marx describes, but not only him, about the modernity is created by the capitalist economy. You can't imagine the modernity <coughs> of the capitalist. I think you are familiar with Weber's The Protestantic Ethic, and, uh, and this is about that. Why didn't it become modernity in China? They were more developed than, than the Europe. And Weber's explanation is the rich. That it, it must have from the Protestants and the capitalist society. And the Confucianism was actually anti modernist <coughs> And the social and the cultural, the social, I will come back to the cultural, is what I mean, those kind of expressions we can see in all. There is one, <coughs> one philosopher who always makes things more complicated. And that's probably why he becomes so popular. And that's Michel Foucault. But he has stressed one very important thing. I don't totally agree with him. But modernity is actually the will to heroize the present. And I think that's very, you get a point there. Modernity is not only that we're living in the, we want to be up to date and so on. We want to heroize ourselves and the modernity. And that goes to the connection to Sweden. Because I think Sweden, perhaps more than in any other countries from the 1930s and on, heroized the modernity in a very specific way. So, um, The next part is a quick course about the Swedish society, but I can make a short stop from this introduction to the next part. If there are any questions you want to put, so please, I just take a break. Otherwise, I do you follow me? <laughs> <coughs> yes. Hello, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a very interesting part which you described about modernity and also culture. Uh, it reminds me, it's very nice, interesting <coughs> book uh, which I found in Loon, by the way, Culture as a Weapon. And it's a uh, very interesting what you say that uh, um, how culture, and I very like it, uh, the comment which you say about architecture. When uh, right now culture should be, uh, and uh, for example, architecture should work for society, not for like for other things, and be not uh, like so far from traditions and like politicians and work for society. I really like it this idea, and I just like make this comment. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm talking about the historical period now, and I read at the end with the question, is this period dead? Is they, do they have, let's say the ar architects, do they have some kind of general ideals about the society? How the society should work and look like this? Or do they only have ideas about what they are actually drawing the houses? I will come back to that. What we don't see today, and that's important, we don't find the same kind of groups come together. With, with, with politicians, with artists, painters, and so on. Even the communists, which we could see in the 1930s, who wanted to create a new, great, wonderful world. We can't see that today. They're working much more separately today. And I, I will a little bit come back to that when I'm talking about Sweden, because that was extremely uh, developed in Sweden. So, a quick... Because my point here is actually to say that Sweden was the most modern country in the world. Okay, say against me. <laughs> You're welcome. And I will now give an explanation why I mean it was, was one of the most modern countries in the world during this period. Not today, but during this period, from the 1930s until the 1970s. 
we represented the modern society in the world, I would say. And I think many outside Sweden would agree that it was a little bit utopia of a modern society. Also an utopia for, for welfare states, but also an utopia for gender equality and so on. So, first of all, the Nordic, uh, the Nordic uh, states are in the periphery of Europe. We are not in the center of Europe. Perhaps you think that after 1930s we were in the center. But during the 19th century we were definitely in the periphery. And that's very important because sometimes new, let's say, ideas to, I mean, to, to actually uh, 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 construct a new society. Normally this is go doing in the periphery, not in the center. And we have a lot of examples, historical examples, right? from ancient time, North Africa, for instance, the, city, the Romans that built cities in a new way in, the, in, the, in the North Africa. We have in Brazil, for instance, and, and a lot of this we can see that many of the utopia was realized in the periphery. And that's important because we didn't have this kind of strong pressure of national identity and traditions and so on, compared with Germany. If we would have, in, we being in the center, we would probably go in the same direction as Germany because we were very connected to it. But we didn't. And uh, the Catholic Church, the downfall of the, of the Catholic church, church, and how the church became controlled by the state, that's also important. So the decline of religion, in a way, in society. Is important. The religion is, let's say, the Calvinist, if you read Weber, the Calvinist religion, the religion is not to be religious in the traditional way. It's to work and it's to be in the society and so on. You're predestinated to the heaven and so on. So it's just to see what signs for this predestination. You don't have so many rituals. The church is not so strong in controlling the, the humans and so on. And that's a part of the Calvinist and Protestant's ideology, compared with Orthodox or the Catholics. And there has been quite homogeneous, I mean, when it comes to religion. We don't have any fights between Catholics and Protestants and so on, which you can see in many countries. So it's a quite homogeneous, not today, but then. We were not in the World War I, World War I, and um, and uh, very, I mean, very few this kind of strife between uh, political strifes or religious strifes and so on. We have had for a long time a very strong social movements, and that's very important. We have been, I don't know today, but Swedish people have been the most organized people in the world. Because all Swedish people should belong to some organization. That could be the labor movement, that could be non-drinking alcohol movement, that could be the farmers movement, and a lot of other movements. That was very important. And those social movements, they organized a lot of the private, let's say, sectors in the people's life. I've been playing table tennis and organized by these kind of organizations and so on. And all these kind of social movements were very pro-modernity. They wanted the society to develop the technology. They were very pro-technology, new technology, pro-modernity. And the trade unions, of course. And, as it says here, the very strong social democratic party, which has been so strong for such a long time in Sweden. It's only Japan who has had one party for such a long time in the government as the Social Democrat in Sweden. And the state in Sweden has been strong for a long time. We have a long history of state control. So this is not created by the Social Democrat or Socialist. I would say the opposite. The Social Democrat could be so strong because we had a very strong state. So, um, also the illiteracy, 
We have we had a long tradition of the priest coming to the house. That's from the 18th century, controlling so the people can read the Luther's catechism. So this control over the over the people has been very strong. So, and these 40 years were social democratic, making the monarchs weak. So, we take the next step. And now we're getting closer, actually, to, to my point of this presentation. In the 1930, there was an exhibition in Stockholm, which is called the Stockholm Exhibition. I could say, before this exhibition, this was really put Sweden on the map. Because suddenly, in this periphery, they were creating a big exhibition, which almost became a world exhibition for people all over the world come to Sweden. Not everybody, of course, but from all over the world, especially from the United States a lot, but also from Europe. Because now Sweden was showing in an exhibition the new modern life. And they also show the new modern being. Many of those exhibitions before have been single object in architecture showing. Now they wanted to construct something, a general plan for how the new society should be built and how the new modern human being should look like. And that shocked uh, many in the world. What's going on there in Sweden? This farmer country, we were one of the most poorest countries in Europe during uh, the, the 19th century. <coughs> one of the countries most dominated by farmers. Suddenly, we wanted to show the rest of the world how the modernity should look by this exhibition. So, I would say this is the exhibition which heroized the modernity more than any other exhibition I've done before, or after, I would say. And this exhibition, it was of course using the modern architecture, Everything should be look very, very modern. I have some not so good pictures about this, but they give a little bit of imagination about the houses. One house was called Paradise. I used to give the name to the Paradise. We have actually in Sweden reached the Paradise in life, and the Paradise is modernity. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I will go to this poster. So this exhibition, they were starting an enormous debate in Sweden, but also all, all over the world about this exhibition. And the discussion was, of course, divided between the more conservative and the liberal and social democratic. The Communist Party was ambivalent. And the reason behind that was actually that Stalin has declared a new kind of art in Russia, which was anti-modernism. So that's, they were really, I mean, divided in the Communist Party. But the Social Democratic Party, the Liberals and so on, they really liked this new world show. Because they could see, oh, this new world would unify the classes, there would be no so much struggle between the classes, it would become a more harmonious society, a rational society. I was writing my dissertation partly, uh, I was writing my dissertation about this, I will come back to that. But during my research, I was looking at posters, electoral posters, during campaign, and I found this poster. Uh, this is from the Social Democratic Women's uh, Magazine, but it was also used as a poster. And I was a little bit shocked because, wow, now I can see how modernist art goes into politics, in the po political rhetoric, propaganda. And this poster is extremely interesting. Because, first of all, we can see the new modern buildings. One is from the uh, uh, Dutch uh, architect, Mies van der Rohe. The other one, I don't know, actually but it's in Stockholm, the other one. And we can see a young couple growing up from this new architecture. That is actually the ground for the new human beings. We can also see that they have one, it's a couple, they have one eye together. 
which actually is to show about this modernity is constructing a gender e uh, equality. And it, uh, I mean, it constructs a gender equality and, and it actually pursues a gender equality. Because without gender equality, you cannot construct a perfect modern society. That's a part of the modernism, or the modernity. It's also say, save the family. And that's a little bit interesting because the conservative was saying that socialists, capitalists partly, modern modernity destroy the family. And partly they say that because women, we have a decline in birth rate. If women didn't want to get married, because they didn't want to get totally controlled by the husband, totally locked in, I wanted to work, become, let's say, a modern human being as well, just as a man. And now they are saying save the family, because they were actually taking the rhetoric from the conservative and put it in their po uh, political propaganda. <laughs> and the only way to save the family was actually gender equality, and to construct a new modern society, a new modern rational society that made it possible for women to go out and work. <coughs> and how would that be possible? I will come back to that. Actually, this poster was a copy from a Russian modernist called Lisitsky. He used that poster in a exhibition in Stuttgart, 1929. I just want to show how they were picking a modern expression from one very famous uh, artist and made it to political propaganda. But you can see it has the same with the one eye together. And you can also see in this, we can be quite unsure which eye in the middle, who does it belong to. Normally people, they are divided up. After, after this exhibition, and, and, uh, and uh, they wrote some of the architects <coughs> and one art historian, they wrote a manifest. It was very popular to write manifests during this time because you have an idea about the future. <coughs> Today we don't have so much. EU perhaps have some manifest about the future EU. They had when they started at least. Not today. This first manifest was called Acceptera, which means to accept. And what they're saying to accept is the present reality. So this goes absolutely back to the word modal and modernity. What is modal and modernity is to accept the present society. And because only if we accept the modernity we have the power to control it. And this manifest is very much about against tradition and it's also a manifest for the whole society. That, that's why they're using this kind of group uh, pictures, not a single person. And in this manifest, I hope you can see this one. I don't have. Can you see this picture from below? You can. Oh yeah, it works. In this manifest, they have a, they have a, on one page. It says here a new human being, <coughs> and it's compared with the old human being. They have chosen. First of all, they have chosen women because they think that the changes by the modernity will perhaps be a bigger changes for women than for men. The changes for men will probably be, in that case, the attitude to us. But the woman itself, herself, will change more than before. So they have chosen not only a woman, they have also chosen a Japanese woman which I find interesting. Because the message in that is that it's time we get the definition of a human. 
is not space or place. If you live in a modern society and accept modernity, we will become modern human beings. We will look quite the same, except from physical differences between a Japanese and a Swedish person, but we will be in the same culture, more or less, and so on. We will have more a global, let's say, society. And the traditions and what's connected to place and so on will disappear in, let's say, the identity of a human being. That Japanese woman will think almost like a Swedish woman, a French woman, American woman, listening to the same music, reading about the same literature, and so on. So this is also actually a discussion of the first discussion of the globalized culture is from them. Sometimes we think we started to discuss globalization and culture 10 years ago. No, no. That's a part of the modernity. Even Marx is writing about we will have a world literature. So, so it goes back. It's a long discussion. So we are actually by this moving from place to time. What's time? So that's a very important shift. Yeah, this is, I will not say so much about that, but that's of course one of the big revolutions with modernism in architecture is actually the city, how to construct a city from this kind of construction we have here. If you walk around in the center of the Kia, for instance, you see a lot of this first, and on the second one, they open up here, and the third one was like this. And I will say a little bit about this, because that has to do it's not only an architectural style, it has to do with health, to being healthy, with cleanliness, with healthiness, and constructing a healthy body. Because in these houses, all the apartments get sun. I can talk hours about sun, healthy, and so on, and bacteria, and so on, which plays a very important role in the world. And, uh, and it's uh, windy here. And it should be windy because you should have fresh air and so There's a lot of this discussion behind this. This was a very unhealthy. Now we started to open up a little bit so more wind can come in and so on. And this is the last. And you see this kind of construction all over the world and without this new way of thinking of healthiness and so Actually, one of the main reason behind this was actually the discovery of the bacteria in the middle of the 19th century. Suddenly, evilness has got a name. You know where you could find the evil things. It's a bacteria. And the bacteria is growing where it's dirty and where it's no circulation of wind, where no sun comes in. All this. <coughs> this is also why people go to beaches to get a tan. That was totally unthinkable 100 years earlier. Suddenly you should lay down in some sweets on very good like this. Even you recognize the Swedish people when it's a little bit the spring comes. You can find Swedish people standing by the wall like this. And a symbol of Swedish people. I saw some in Ukraine doing the same, but not so many. Okay. So, now, when I started to try to cover in my dissertation what is modernity with Swedish as an utopia as a case, I started to see that to understand modernity is actually how political, ethical, aesthetical discourses and rationality and science come together in a more general discourse about the society. They have to pick to really to construct this utopia. They have to bring together all this. It should be changes in the political sphere, in the economical sphere, in, in let's say, in the cultural, and in actually the daily life, and so on. You should combine all this to create a new human being. And in this, if we go to Sweden, all these discourses actually come together in the Social Democratic Party. 
which means that socialism was not a utopia from the 1930s and on. Today it's almost liberalist that it's the utopia for social democratic in Sweden, but that's another thing. But then the change from socialism to modernity. That was actually the utopia for the social democratic party, not socialism anymore, to construct modernity. And in this modernity was to update everything in the society to a modern context. And that means also you have to have a definition of what is going on today, what is modernity. And that was very much focused on, let's say, rationality, and on, uh, yeah, we say rationality, a healthy body, for instance, science, and so on, play an important role. And against traditions, traditional beliefs, and so on, which was seen as something against modernity. So when I, for me to say, to construct this modern human being, when I was looking at all these contexts that come together, there was a discussion about the concept, we could say, a cultural lag became very important. Some areas in the society represent a cultural lag, was behind modernity. Now it has to do to update all this, let's say, lag in the society. And of course, one of, of the lag was the relationship between men and women, and the situation for women. How to update this, how to bring up the woman to, let's say, to be equal with the man. Then the society must organize in another way. We have to organize, which we have done the very early, we have to organize, the society should organize the child, Care, for instance, we were really in the front to organize this kind of kindergarten from the beginning so the women can go out and work. We need to have a more rational household, more rational architecture and so on in the houses to make the daily life much easier. And we, may, we must focus on health and cleanliness and so on for the disease. So all this kind of, let's say, trying to uh, update different areas in the society become important. So, when I was looking at this, how, how was this kind of connected together? When I was looking at that, I always met a woman in the front of the discussion. And I would say it would be impossible not being a woman, because women were those who discussed the private life and everyday life. And to update to everyday life, the women must be involved in the discussion. Because the men were not so much engaged in the childcare, in the cooking, in the daily life, in the cleaning at home, and so on and so on. That was the women who was going to do that. So I, I would say, I argue for that it's the, the first modern man, in my perspective, who combined all this, must be a woman. And in Sweden, it for surely was. And there's also a name of this woman because she was involved in all this kind of discussion all the time. And her name is Alva Myrdal. I don't know if anyone has heard about her. She played a very important role in Sweden during the 1930s, 1940s. Later on, she became uh, very international and worked for the United Unions. She got the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, for instance. And she was also married to one of the most famous economists in the world by then, who was come from Sweden, called Gunnar Myrdal, which plays an important role in the economic economy of that. He actually was before Keynes to deliver this kind of theory, the state should be more active in the economy to actually get uh, when it was an de economical depression, the state should play an important role to do investment and so on. That's, uh, I suppose you have discussed Keynes in some of your courses about economy. And of course, this fits together with the society should be more active. The state should be more active to develop the modernity. So it must be a strong state, in a way, if, if the modernity should cover the whole society. With a weak state, 
it would be impossible, in my opinion. And in Sweden, we had a strong state. We have had it for several hundred years. We have a social democratic party, which in their ide ideology also said it must be a strong state. That's a part of socialism, of course. So this Adam Myrdal was, I would see, I would say, in, in a Liberian way, we construct idol types when we want to understand something. And I would say she actually is a real, in reality, an idol type of how to construct a modern, modern society. Um, so, um, she was during the 1930s, she was, uh, of course, a member of the Social Democratic Party, and the, at her home, a lot of artists, and economists, and politicians, and so on, come together to actually try to design the new modern world in Sweden. So there was a group, really, around her and her husband. She was very engaged in, she was actually the principal for the first school for those who were going to work in kindergarten. She was very engaged in, 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 in sexuality. She was saying that we must rationalize sexuality. I don't know how to do that, but even you do. She was saying we have to control it in another way. And that has to do with protection to getting birth. So she was very pro that you should deliver this kind of protection everywhere to everybody. So women don't give birth or become pregnant without they want to get pregnant. This was important. So she was almost everywhere in this discussion of a new human being. The private life, the everyday life, the architecture, the politics, the economy, and so on. To, and combine that in a, in, in, in a fantastic way. So we could say by this idea of modernity, who is going, the modernity should affect every part of the society. That's also, the society should be total. And of course, now we're getting very close to totalitarian society. That the society controls every sphere of life. And, so on. and I think that they, were, they didn't go that far. But they were quite close to do it. But I would also say, if they haven't taken this kind of political, let's say, and ideological and cultural expression of modernity, the Nazi party would have been much, much stronger in Sweden than it became. Because a lot of the Nazi party, they did the same, of controlling the whole society, also talking about a, a, a new human being, and they, they were actually, many of the aesthetic was very close to the modernist, but also different, and so on, so many symbols are also the same. But they actually, they reduce this force uh, uh, in Sweden by having this kind of total idea of a new society. And uh, as a last picture, I just show her and her husband. And they are, in many ways, symbol for the modern society in Sweden, in many ways. Some wouldn't agree, but uh, I would say they have affected this modernity quite a lot. Today, yeah, we could show a picture of the postmodern architecture that actually destroying the modernist architecture. We could have a lot of discussion. Do we still have this idea of a society that a little bit controls all the spheres of the society? <coughs> so, um, what I mean is. I think a lot of these ideas from this time are still alive in Sweden for sure. We still have this kind of idea of a very strong welfare state, even the liberals and so on have this idea of a strong welfare state and so on. We still have the idea of the gender equality. We are not totally equal in Sweden. We are not. Far from. But we are perhaps the most equal country in the world so far. And the reason behind that goes back to, to what I'm talking about. It goes back to the 1930s and the idea of, 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 uh, of uh, a modern society. And um, 
So it must be a woman. Because men, they are too conservative. They are too much into tradition. And they are the big loser. In the yeah, they are. They are the loser in the, in the... I'm cleaning at home, I'm cooking, I'm doing everything. I have a lot of new... <laughs> taking care of kids and so on. I could uh, go out with my friends and have beer instead of, of this. Uh, and so, in a way, I would say it must be a room that is most modern human being. And uh, we could also see in this film how active women was in this fight for a modern world. I open up for question, and with this, we have a couple of minutes left. So please say you are talking bullshit about Sweden and modernity. <laughs> yes! Good. It's me again. Uh, yeah, sure. right. that's good. Uh, isn't the positive uh, eugenic, eugenics a uh, positive part of a system of healthcare in Sweden? Yeah, yeah. The better man. Wasn't it, or, or was it, or wasn't it? I, it is Sweden. I don't understand your question. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, let me say. Uh, the Sweden, I uh, read that the Sweden is the uh, yeah, this is a modern <laughs> part of time. <laughs> it has a really, even this uh, social democratic government, it had a really strong uh, positive eugenics program. Uh, was it a part uh, of? Uh, Finding a new modern man. This is actually, there was an institute in Sweden uh, that wanted to control that some people should not have kids. And that could be a very weighty <coughs> underventured people, that could be a different kind of disabled, that could also be alcoholists, or social, and not fitting the society. More that, that they should be sterilized and so on. That's what you mean, I suppose. And, and yes. Yeah. Uh, there was a discussion about this. And actually, I could say that he was a very good friend with some of the uh, doctors. And he was a little bit on the way, talking about this as well. Uh, but, Adam Mudon, no, definitely not. And it never became, let's say, an important part of the propaganda of the modern society. It existed, yes. And I would say, in a way, I would say it's connected to modernity, to create a new modern human being, a very healthy, a very clean, and, I mean, a very active, and so on. It's a part of that. We could see that in, in Germany, for instance. The German went to Sweden, actually, to check this kind of, of institute, how it works, and so on. This is very, very embarrassing <coughs> that we actually did that. And it was, you're totally right, and that's very interesting. Yeah. I've been written several books about this. How was this connected to, to, to the way of thinking? And here we come when you go from the total to the totalitarian society. Yes, and the yes. second question is yes. also about uh, the <coughs> rationality of a modern world. Yeah. Isn't the Rational becomes a basis of uh, uh, this uh, technocratic uh, new society, what can be also be interpreted as totalitarian. Because this a technocratic society, we mostly don't need the like uh, ninety percent of people of the world who are isn't that uh, much uh, intellectual technocrats. They just a bit bad, but. <laughs> Average person. What? Average person. Yeah, average person, yeah. Uh, isn't uh, the rational basis as well? So that's what we are saying. That's his yeah, argument. That's, 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 that's the Liberian. Uh, uh, also, Simmons' critics against the modern society, that it will be dominated by technocrats and so on. It's actually, there are no real, let's say, feelings or human values. In, in this, yes, yes, yes that's right. rational values and rational <laughs> values. That's that's how I describe a bureaucratic organization. That that's a description of that. And I would say yes. I would say we went very far in that. We have a very rational bureaucracy. I promise you. Even if we in Sweden complain, but if you have been living in some other countries, 
you don't complain anymore in Sweden because it's extremely rich. I think if you compare with Ukraine, I would say we are quite more rational in the bureaucracy than you are. I've been living in Italy, I've been living in China, so quite a long time I met the bureaucracy and so on. It's very, very technocratic, rational and so on. And if we give people right, so do we lose anything in this? Do we lose some social world feelings and happiness? Craziness. What's left? A robot? <laughs> yeah, that's a war. Uh, yes, it's right. would, the world wouldn't be co uh, commanded with God, it would be commanded with silence. Yeah. So. And perhaps this argument can be used also for two key traditional values. Some which ways, yeah. a part of that is has to do with gender issues. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yes? Uh, what do you think? Uh, can Ukraine uh, be the country where people are uh, gender, generally equal? I'm not the right person to answer that. I think. No, so I, I, I think you because uh, you I have think, uh, not, yeah. uh, another view. On the yeah, situation. another view would be, first of all, I think it would take time. Uh, I think uh, it has quite a lot to do with the uh, state and what the state is doing. It has to do with tax to pay and so on and how you actually deliver the income of the state to the people but perhaps also a general a political idea how to do that and I'm not sure there are. It's not perhaps not such a big issue for politicians to talk about gender equality in Ukraine, is it? Is it on the political agenda? On the top agenda? I suppose not. Uh, what I think when you talk about that, that's one of my points in, in actually my presentation, that gender issues must be connected to other issues in the society. It's not a separate issue. And it's not an issue that will come by itself. There's a fight for it uh, in many ways and so on. And it, there must be again that to explain why is gender equality positive for society? How do we actually get advantage of this? And that's exactly what they were saying. We get an advantage of this. The decline of birth rate, for instance. We need workforce. And so on. Now we solve, solve the workforce partly by immigrants. It's weak. We also have a decline in birth rate now, but it's going up again. So I don't know about Ukraine, to be honest, but uh, it doesn't look that good right now. Uh, I see, uh, I see on my short visits here, I can notice that, uh, a little bit more. And uh, when I talk to people, so I can. Uh, I get explanation that the gender equality is far behind from Sweden. Uh, and I think it goes many times has to do with the man's how they see themselves as a man. What is a man? I think that's partly uh, partly has to do with it. That was you. Uh -huh. uh, thank you for your lecture. <laughs> it was not only an uh, interesting presentation of your topic, but also a uh, nice presentation of your country. <laughs> so thank you. And then um, my question is it's about modernity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Um, we uh, heard a lot about positive uh, side of modernity mm -hmm. and uh, positive values of modernity, such as rationality and equality and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, you talked nothing about uh, and said nothing about um, so-called dark side of modernity, yeah. as for, for example Jeffrey Alexander called. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of critics yeah. of modernity uh, produced by the modern position. I mean, not only conservative critics, all the Frankfurt School, such uh, new Adorno. theoreticians, and Bruno Latour, yeah. and maybe uh, some other theoreticians. Also, yeah. how do you explain? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the Frankfurt School, for instance, Adorno's, uh, the, like, the dialectics of uh, enlightenment and so on, is a very critical 
and Adorno was against jazz music and so on. <laughs> he was very conservative. He's a brilliant, a brilliant, I mean, philosopher for sure. He's uh, definitely. And yeah, Frida Examples, yeah, partly he's a sort of, not personalist, but he still criticized modernity from that perspective. And a lot of, I mean, that's a, especially since the 1970s, I would say, started this critics of modernity. Which means that Simmel becomes more popular, Weber becomes more popular again, and so on. Together with new postmodern uh, thinkers, both in architecture, Charles Jens, for instance, we have uh, 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 several, Frederick James, and that, there's a lot of these kind of. We have, yes, there is. That's what I say. This, the disadvantages I can see in this is when how close you go from the total to the totalitarian. Mm -hmm. I think that's. That's one of the critics we can have. And I would say, in many ways, we were, in the ideas they have there, were quite close to this, to go to the step that the state controlled every part of the human life. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I think that's the... Uh, um, then we have a lot of reaction. For instance, in architecture, there's a lot of reactions. The saying, I mean, this terrible, rational architecture. So there is no... I mean, that's what the postmodern architect did. They, they, they started to construct the cities different, also the architecture, using traditional symbols and so on. That, um, and there was a saying that the reality is in the surface. And there was a lot of this to say. I, I totally agree, but my presentation, I also want to go against some of this critique. Because there has been more... more okay, Habermas has, has actually defended the modernity mm -hmm. more than anyone. I was very, I was postmodernist for a while, and so I'm very against uh, uh, Habermas and, and some of the others. And so. But I'm, I'm changing now more and more. I want to really bring up what in the modernity was very positive for society, and I can see tendencies today which I find is, I, I find it's very, very dangerous, which goes against it with, with the traditions, with nationalism, and many of these going back, which is anti-modernist in many ways. And my fear today is actually those development, and that's why I want to bring back the modernity in the, in the discourse again. Yeah. Uh, okay, I have a question about nowadays rising flash of conservative parties and conservative movements all over the world, and yeah. how their rhetoric changed uh, concerning the new role of women and new tendency towards gender, yeah. gender equality. But go to, have you seen any of these conservative nationalists saying gender issues is a very big important thing? Yeah. You have? So, really? Yeah, I, I, I want have. your opinion, your like, structural opinion yeah. about how the rhetoric changed yeah. as a sociologist. Yeah, uh, so the rhetoric, we have a new party in Sweden, for instance, uh, it's called the uh, Sweden, Sweden Democratic Party which represent in the Europe its tendencies of new nationalist party. And they are in when it comes okay, in Sweden you can't be too traditional because we are so used to a more gender equal. But if you look at their politics and reforms and so on, it's more to bring back the woman to the house. Mm -hmm. To support this economic and yeah. how society answers to this? Because, for example, in Sweden you are more into gender equality mm. and the society is used to this, and yeah. women also. Yeah. And when you have these kind of reforms, uh, you can push into some mm. arguments mm. and uh, bet... Mm. Uh, I mean, many of the conservative, conservative parties, they, they want to focus on theological difference. That's what comes. Women and men, they are theological differences and so on, which means they are different and they should do different things. It's quite common they want to support women to take care of the kids, to find a way to do that. And I would say a part of this actual way of thinking traditional is that you can see in all conservatives, almost all conservatives, very much against not only gender equality, but against homosexuality and many other expressions of of, I would say, uh, 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 liberation of, 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 of uh, But my human. question was rather yeah. about how the society in Sweden can cope with this kind of rhetoric, because 
I thought that it's much more liberal on how they yeah. have this. Do you know what happened in the last elections? There was no majority. And now the Social Democratic and the Liberals go together to keep the new Conservatives out of influence. And that was a really tough for the Liberals to cope with the Social Democrats. They cope with the enemies. Yes, because they want them out of the, out of the influence of the, of the society. But uh, the, 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 we, don't, we have one, one Conservative party in Sweden. But they have been during the last years more and more liberal. But now we can see a tendency that those traditional conservative values come back into the party. And they, they don't want to cope with the, this nationalist party, but they're getting closer and closer to each other. And that worries me a lot in the, for the future in, in Sweden, that they could be that strong that they actually become, come into the government together in the future. So Sweden was very late to have this kind of nationalist party in Denmark and Norway. France and so on, we have it for many years. In Sweden it's quite new. So we have actually get rid of them for a long time, but not any longer. And they have about 20% of the of the votes today, which is quite high actually. Very high. And this is uh, shocking for many of us Swedes that this could happen. One reason is of course we took a lot of refugees, so that is using this kind of anti-immigrant uh, 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 as an um, argument for their politics. That's why they actually have so many percentages. Not because they are conservative and against modernity, it's because they're immigrants. That's, they focus totally on immigrants in their in the rhetoric. So, uh, and you can see that in Hungary and Poland and, and everywhere. That it has a lot to do with immigrants. But it's connected to other issues as well, as nationalism are. So they, they, they actually have the old conservative values. They call themselves social conservatives and so on. No, so that's, uh, that's what I want is modernity coming back. <laughs> so it's a political propaganda. Happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You uh, yeah. um, started the presentation from the definition that modernity is present. Mm. And um, I wonder that pro modernity as a project, mm. uh, was it over? Or it has some ways and uh, in sense that uh, uh, to have our politics for today, mm. we have to uh, focus on present as a modern project. Or we have looking back, like you, you all know Harari and all this uh, Conservatives say that our golden age was in tradition and uh, let's go, mm. let's see our uh, heritage. Mm. Or we should go to see a future as a pattern that we have yeah, to yeah. approach and go like yeah. in. Uh, yeah, you know, that's, like. what uh, is the hope? That's the, the, the dilemma for modernity and modern, to use the concept for how long can modernity and modern be modern? Yeah. When does it become historical? That's a conflict for architecture, for instance, and, and that we could also see that to be modernist today is to be traditional. <laughs> and that's, of course, a dilemma. That in this context, the concept of post-modernity comes from. One who has formulated is very good, not directly connected to my, to my presentation, but that Franz Lyotard, who wrote a book about the postmodern condition, la condition postmodern, and he said postmodernity is the beginning of modernity. It's not the end of modernity. So he actually used the concept in a new way. And I find that very interesting because in the beginning of modernity, a lot of interesting thing happens, which he wanted to bring into the post-modernity. Then there's a lot of other things in Leotard I don't agree, but I think this is a dilemma to talk about what happened in the past and say that then you become traditional. So I'm traditional actually. I want to go back to traditions. But I want to go back to a tradition who wanted to get rid of traditions. <laughs> so that makes it complicated. Then I don't want totally, I, I, I still want to have some tradition. We have as we, I still want to celebrate Christmas as we do and have the food as we want and so on. But uh, perhaps we should be a little bit afraid when this is growing a lot of society. That's in my opinion. 
because it's normally will bring a lot of people to suffer. Yes? Thank you.